Dear friends, I, my name is Father Thomas Joseph. I'm the rector of the university and on behalf of the Angelicum community, I'm happy to welcome here tonight all of our guests and especially our members of the, of the uh, rabbinic and the Jewish community. I'd like to, in a special way, recognize the presence of Ricardo de Segni, the uh, chief rabbi of Rome, and also the uh, Raphael Schultz, the ambassador of Israel to the Holy See. We're very honored to have you both here this evening. This is uh, the beginning, the inauguration of a three-day conversation uh, that will take place at the Angelicum and at the Gregorian University, which is co-sponsored by both institutions on the topic of the place of the land theologically in the life of the people of Israel and in Catholic reflection on the people of Israel. It's a event co-sponsored by the Cardinal Bea Center for Judaic Studies at the Gregorian University and its director Etienne Vetu has been uh, instrumental in co-organizing this event with the Thomistic Institute here. Dr. Father Simon Gain is the director and is present and we have the visiting Aquinas chair, um, uh, Professor uh, Gavin DaCosta who has organized this as part of his ongoing work of conversation between Catholics and, and Jews. We'd like to thank also the staff of the uh, Bayes Center and the um, Thomistic Institute for all their work for this conversation. The Angelicum has a long interest in Jewish Catholic conversations, uh, principally through the John Paul II Center for Interreligious Dialogue, which is housed within our Institute for Ecumenical Studies and which uh, continues to explore the relationship between Jews and Catholics as it's interpreted in light of the Second Vatican Council, uh, especially Nostra Aetate, and to think about the uh, magisterium and in the post-conciliar church, the ongoing dialogues between Catholics and Jews. We thank the Russell Berry Foundation for their support in that initiative that they sustain with, in working with us. There have been, um, as we all know, a number of instrumental responses on the, uh, on the part of the Jewish community to the work of Nostra Aetate and the ongoing conversations between Catholics and Jews in recent decades, among them Dabu Emerit, which it can be called in its by its subtitle, A Jewish Statement on Christians and Christianity, which Rabbi David Novak was involved with and who was instrumental in helping um, prepare this conference, though sadly was unable to be present. And in 2015, a group of Orthodox rabbis from around the world published the, vo the document to do the will of our Father in heaven toward a partnership between Jews and Christians, uh, a major statement, and three of the rabbis who were uh, instrumental to that document, uh, Rabbi Ahearns and David Rosen and Eugene Korn, are happily able to be here. Um, and that is the document that Archbishop Forte will address this evening. And uh, from 2017, there was another document published uh, in the dialogue between Jerusalem and Rome, Reflections on 50 Years of Nostra Aetate, sound, uh, signed by uh, the rabbinate, members of the rabbinate of both you know, the United States, Israel, and Europe. It's in this context that we are continuing to explore these coming days, the ongoing um, enrichment of conversation that takes place between Jews and Catholics as they seek to understand one another and to be sensitive to each other's theological inclinations and commitments and also to think about ways we can respect, collaborate with one another and also more deeply understand each other's place in the plan of God, each according to our own logic, but also in a mutually appreciative way. It's in that spirit that we invite tonight Archbishop Bruno Forte to address us, and we uh, are happy to have a response by Professor Karma ben Yohanan. So I'll say a word about each. Uh, Archbishop Forte is a, a very well-known theologian in the Universal Catholic Church, and especially in Italy. He was born in Naples. We can debate where the historic center of uh, Italy is. It's a famous debate among Italians, but I think Naples would be one of the chief uh, positions. 
He studied at Tübingen University and oh, spent time in Paris and gained a Laurea, a Laurea degree in philosophy from Naples University. In the year 2000, he oversaw the preparation of the famous Vatican document, Memory and Reconciliation, The Church and the Faults of the Past, which led to the famous liturgy in St. Peter's Basilica in which Pope John Paul II asked for God's forgiveness for sins on the, on the part of Catholic uh, members of the church toward non-Catholic members. He was appointed as Archbishop of Chieti Vasto by Pope John Paul II on the 26th of June in 2004 and has served as Special Secretary for the Synod of Bishops on the Family since 2019. He is Consultor for the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews and he teaches dogmatic theology at the Pontifical Faculty of Theology uh, dell'Italia Meridionale in the Southern Italian region. He's written many books, some of them particularly poignant for our conversations. Uh, Jerusalem e Città della Pace, Croce Via dei Conflitti, Vorrei Palati di Dio, La Santa Radice, Fede Cristiana ed Ebreismo, uh, as well as Catholic works, works of Catholic theology known to many, The Essence of Christianity, The Trinity as History, Saga of the Christian God. After he presents, we'll hear a response this evening from Professor uh, Karma bin Yohanan, who, is, who studied at Tel Aviv University, originally a native of Israel. She has, since 2020, lived in Germany, where she is the Chair of Jewish-Christian Relations at the Faculty of Theology at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And as I've just learned, she's the uh, first uh, Jewish appointee in that, uh, in that Protestant faculty. Her book, Jacob's Younger Brother, Jewish-Christian Relations After Vatican II, just came out with Harvard University Press, and the book's Hebrew version was published by Tel Aviv University Press in 2020 and received the Salman Sharar Prize for Research in Jewish History. So we have two eminently qualified conversationalists this evening to begin our exchanges. Uh, Archbishop Forte will present in Italian, there is a translation that's written, that's available, and you also have headphone devices if that's uh, to your liking. And then the response will be in English. Please help me welcome our guests. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Father Etienne Vute and all the organizers of uh, this colloquium for the invitation to speak at the beginning of this international colloquium on next steps in the Jewish-Catholic dialogue here at the Angelicum University. I am honored and grateful, unfortunately because of my engagements as Archbishop of the Diocese of Chietivasto, I am not able to remain here all the days of the meeting because of the many commitments I have in my diocese, but uh, I am so glad to share with you some reflections about the theme. I am deeply involved in the Jewish-Christian dialogue, and that's why I accepted the invitation as a special chance to contribute to future steps of our common work. And of course, I will say it after. I sincerely thank Professor Karma Ben Johanan for her contribution to our ref common reflection. Even if I start by speaking English, I decided to give my lecture in Italian, <laughs> the language of the country where we are and my mother tongue. But all of you, as, you uh, as it was said, have the text also in English. And of course, I am ready to welcome every intervention in the dialogue in the language of the Bardo, William Shakespeare. I shall present some reflections from a Catholic point of view about the decla declaration adopted in March 2016 by the Conference of European Rabbis, the Rabbinical Council of America, and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel. 
I structure my speech in five steps as the five arches of a bridge between thought and life. First, a statement of historical significance. Two, biblical theological contents of the declaration. Three, a turn around. Four, the land, a relevant theme only hinted at. And finally, towards a new future. May the Lord bless our dialogue and our common will to serve his blessed name and to promote our common commitment. Anzitutto, dunque, il documento tra Gerusalemme e Roma come un documento di portata storica. Si tratta di una riflessione ortodossa ebraica sul rapporto fra ebraismo e cristianesimo, elaborata nel contesto del cinquantesimo anniversario di nostre etate, la dichiarazione del Concilio Vaticano II, che ha cambiato in profondità l'atteggiamento della Chiesa Cattolica, in particolare verso l'ebraismo. Datato Rosh Kodesh Adar, del primo 5776, il 10 febbraio 2016, il documento è stato adottato nel marzo 2016 dalla Conferenza dei Rabbini Europei e dal Comitato Esecutivo del Consiglio Rabbinico d'America ed è stato presentato a Papa Francesco il 31 agosto del 2017 da una delegazione formata da tre delle principali istituzioni rabbiniche internazionali la Conferenza dei Rabbini Europei, il Rabbinato Centrale di Israele e il Consiglio Rabbinico d'America. Naturalmente ci sarebbero da citare anche altri testi importanti, per esempio il documento rabbinico ortodosso sul cristianesimo pubblicato dal Centro for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation 2015, intitolato To do the will of our Father in Heaven, Toward a partnership between Jews and Christian. Ma mi limito a questa dichiarazione perché è da essa che muove la mia riflessione stasera come contributo al nostro colloquio. Con buone ragioni l'evento dell'approvazione del testo e della sua presentazione al Vescovo di Roma può essere definito storico. Per la prima volta il Rabbinato Ortodosso Internazionale ha dato una valutazione unitaria sul dialogo con la Chiesa Cattolica, in riferimento non solo alla nostra età, ma anche all'intero sviluppo delle relazioni con il mondo ebraico. E facendo parte della Commissione Mista di dialogo fra la Chiesa Cattolica e il Gran Rabbinato di Israele, ci sono altri membri qui, come David Rosen, per esempio, io posso dire del clima di amicizia, di reciproca accoglienza e comune lavoro che si respira in, questo, in questa Commissione. È veramente la gioia di un incontrarci e per me di un essere arricchito dalla sapienza degli amici rabbini con la loro conoscenza delle scritture. Certo, questo non nega le inconciliabili differenze teologiche, Obviously, this is not to deny the differences, uh, and uh, I believe that each uh, effort uh, in trying to understand the other without uh, giving up uh, the truth of our own identity, and I think that this is the style of our own dialogue. I believe that dialogue, uh, and the others may confirm this, uh, we enrich, we become enriched in the respect of our own diversities. Pope Francis uh, has recognized that the declaration uh, is not uh, hiding the differences, uh, and he is also highlighting that this is ex also expressing the firm willingness to collaborate today and in the future. So this is a step forward from which there is no going back, with respect to which uh, we can only go forward with renewed commitment while uh, carrying forward our mutual relations. Uh, in a very simple word, uh, What I was constantly saying to my students when I was a professor of theology, in which I still happen to be as the archbishop of a church, 
a Christian who is not loving Israel and doesn't want to know it in the, its own depth is not even a Christian because the idea of Israel being the holy Ruth, the so-called Agyarizza, as Paul says, of the Christian tree makes it so that the Christian tree has no life without the vital relationship with the Jewish world, a relationship which is made of respect, uh, welcoming, esteem, and collaboration. Part number two, what are the contents, uh, the biblical theological contents of the Declaration? Let me start off from the preamble, which uh, recalls the biblical foundation of the mission of the Jewish people. This is a beautiful reflection because it highlights, starting from the biblical narration, the fundamental principle, which is at the very basis of each meeting and dialogue taking place within groups uh, and individuals. Uh, the inequivocal message of the Bible is uh, that all human beings are members of a single family. And after the deluge of Noah, this message was uh, reinforced when the new phase of history once again was inaugurated by a single family. And the providence of God uh, aims at uh, a universal, undifferentiated humanity. I believe that these uh, words, uh, if they have a significance and if they are valid for the relationship between Christians and uh, Jews, are very important and also entail great bitterness in this very precise moment, especially if we think of what is happening in uh, Ukraine, where a people is being uh, invaded and uh, undergoes the aggression and is suffering incredibly. There are Jews and Christians alike that suffer, and it is not a chance that the president of Ukraine is a Jew, and it is not a chance that he is also equally representing the compassion of Jews and Christians that live and are part of that nation. So please allow me to say that in this very moment, I would like to offer to God this our meeting of us ours for the cause of a just cause, uh, which we hope uh, entails a situation in the very near future. Now, this is where we have to look at the vision of the patriarchs, Abraham and Jacob. And uh, the idea was the one of founding the nation of Israel, which would uh, also allow for a model of society in the Holy Land uh, to be perceived as a source of light for the entire humanity. So Israel has a meaning, a universal meaning. Let me say that uh, Israel is for all of us, for the entire mankind, what I just said. This is a message that should always be recalled, the love towards the land of Israel, the love towards uh, the biblical knowledge, uh, the Jewish thought, the rabbinic world. All of them are a typical trait of all those who have at heart the cause of mankind, uh, seen as a, a universal brotherhood. The Holy Father says, according to the declaration, was once again manifesting, manifested, and the rest of Israel was uh, gathering all of its forces and allowed for the reawakening of the Jewish uh, awa conscience. Uh, and many Jews then answered uh, to the vibrant appeal to go back uh, to Peretz Israel, where the sovereign Jewish state arose in this very context of rebirth. The, the two duties of the Jewish people towards humanity have emerged. And here, let me just recall them to my own Jew, Jewish brothers, to my even Jewish sisters. Let's see them. The first one is uh, that the Jewish uh, nation has many blessings in uh, the field of uh, science, uh, technology, literature, commerce, as well as uh, in the realm of faith, the spirituality, ethics, and morality. And uh, recognizing in this, uh, in all this, a manifestation of the eternal covenant of God with the Jewish people. I like to stress this point, dear. Uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, you have a mission towards uh, 
humankind. Israel is not an end to itself. It's a sign which is um, elevated among the people, and this is uh, a church which uh, bel church believes, and not an alternative uh, to um, a view of Israel, but uh, in continuation of what uh, Holy Israel is for um, the Christians. So Shoah is obviously the historical uh, nadir of the suffering of the Jewish people. In this regard, the Declaration makes a series of affirmations that come very close to what the Catholic Church sustained in the document, Memory and Reconciliation, I hope, and I uh, suppose that many of you have read it. Um, I was the uh, main drafter of that uh, document. I had the task of uh, chairing the commission which um, drafted it, and I can assure you it wasn't an easy task because uh, as uh, uh, you say, when there are two Jews, there are three opinions. When there are two Catholics, there are even more opinions. But um, I tried to uh, coordinate the work. The text was approved um, by John Paul II. Uh, and uh, in this document, Memory and Reconciliation, there's an, also an important role in the request for forgiveness, which the Church uh, addresses to the Jewish people for having too many times cooperated or even uh, just simply consented the persecution, the isolation of uh, this uh, people which was given to humankind by God. Obviously, the Shoah was the result of a pagan ideology, as uh, Nazism was, but we should also say that we need to ask uh, forgiveness because the persecution against the Jews was um, facilitated by anti-Jewish prejudice in the hearts and minds of uh, some Christians. Certainly there were Christians who offered um, their assistance and support to the persecutor, particularly the Jews who risked their lives to save and help their Jewish uh, neighbors. My predecessor uh, in Kirti, Archbishop Venturi saved uh, the lives of many Jews. And there are uh, texts which I've also given to the members of the Mixed Committee, who, which have um, reconstructed the uh, action of this Jew, of this uh, bishop who was uh, very conservative initially, and initially um, a supporter of uh, fascism who uh, distances himself from fascism when the racial laws are applied and who um, saves the lives of many Jews, um, allowing their escape to, from Italy to countries in Latin America. So alongside these brave um, men and women, spiritual resistance and concrete action of other Christians was not that which might have been expected from Christ's followers. This fact constitutes a call to the consciences of all Christians today, so as to require a, a teshuva, a, an act of repentance, and to be a stimulus to increase efforts to be transformed by renewal of one's mind and to keep a moral and religious memory of the injury inflicted on the Jews. <clears throat> so um, the, second, the second stage is the um, biblical uh, contribution in the de to the Declaration. But in what way is this Declaration a turnaround in the relations between Jews and Christians, and particularly between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people? We can say that uh, this uh, turnaround occurs uh, 50 years ago, 20 years after the Shoah, with the um, Declaration Nostra Etate, particular number four when the Catholic Church began a process of introspection that increasingly led to any, to um, expurgating any hostility towards Jews from the Church doctrine, enabling trust and confidence to grow between our respective faith communities. Here we uh, recognize the courageous role played by Pope John XXIII, my predecessor in Kirti, was Monsignor uh, Loris Capovilla, who was a secretary to Pope John the Twenty-Third, and many tales of uh, Monsignor Capovilla told to me, um, proved to me that this uh, Pope 
uh, love to the Jewish people. And I think that Nostra Etate would not have been possible without the spirit of John the 23rd, a good man, and at the same time, a historian, uh, someone who understood the dramas of history had an important role in rescuing Jews in the Shoah, but also in overcoming the teaching of contempt that has caused so much harm in the relationship of uh, Christians with their Jewish brothers. The Declaration makes a decisive um, affirmation in this regard of the value of the contribution of the Second Vatican Council. And I quote, in its most focused, concrete, and for the Church most dramatic assertion, Nostretate recognized that any Jew who was not directly and personally involved in the crucifixion did not bear any responsibility for it. Rightly then, and with a, we, 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 we see the, the end of that judgment which saw the Jews as uh, enemies uh, of uh, Christ and the deep conviction that uh, Judaism not, is not a, an adversary but actually the holy root uh, which we uh, constantly need. Rightly, uh, then the declaration mentions what for believers is the foundation of the unique nature of the Jewish people in the history of salvation. Nostra stated that the um, divine election of Israel will not be revoked by God. God uh, does not uh, repent his uh, gifts or calls. And a text uh, by Pope Francis in Vangeli Gaudium is mentioned where it says, God uh, continues to work among uh, the people of the old pact in order to advance the wisdom which uh, derives from their the words of that, and so the links which the church recognizes as having with uh, Israel on the basis of uh, d divine uh, choice, it's God who has chosen Israel, not us. We obey God, uh, loving Israel and recognizing ourselves con in continuity with this uh, sacred, sacred root for this um, divine initiative of dialogue with uh, Judaism for the Christians occupies a special place because of its roots. Uh, Christianity is uh, joined with uh, Judaism more than it is with any other religion and therefore the Judaic uh, Christian dialogue is defined interreligious only um, with uh, reservations. It's not truly an interreligious dialogue. It is rather an intra-religious or intrafamilial dialogue. Uh, dear uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, when we talk with you, we are uh, in the family, and you uh, allow us to understand ourselves much better than with any others. Perhaps we too can also help you to understand uh, something of yourselves better. But the relationship with Israel is uh, of decisive importance for the Christian church. It's not an option. It is not a concession to um, the right tone. <coughs> it is uh, essential. So the Catholic uh, Church does not conduct or support any specific institutional mission work directed towards Jews. There's a full respect of the shared part towards full reconciliation, um, independently of the individual parts of each, which um, can lead to various results I've met. And I've uh, also loved uh, Jewish people who are convinced that, uh, like Rina Geffman, who was a woman who I uh, appreciated, um, Russian, French, uh, Jew, Jewish woman who became Catholic, but this is not. This is a personal um, story. The authentic relationship is the one which sees in Israel the holy root which we need, and therefore the reconciliation which we look to with Israel, um, we move towards with Israel, cannot be a reconciliation which cancels a difference. But it must be a common path which overcomes any idea of substitution. What uh, truly needs to be uh, 
uh, jettisoned is the idea of the church taking the place of Israel in the uh, divine design, divine plan, what Paul calls uh, mystery. Um, uh, the Israel uh, continues to be the holy root on which the church is grafted and uh, without which it's not possible to do without. And in the divine plan, therefore, for Christian theology, there is the people of the unrefoked covenant and there is the people established in the alliance established by uh, Christ in a single uh, design of salvation in a um, uh, to the one which um, the uh, alliance uh, of God with the Jews to the one which we have with uh, Christ. And uh, now we come to the issue of the land, which is a significant thing, which is only hinted at in the declaration. And here I would like to explore it a bit more. Despite the significance for, um, f for Jewish faith and history of the um, land is not truly present in the declaration. There's a mention in the preamble and at the um, end of the preamble, but actually for Eretz, land is so important that it occupies the fourth place in order of recurrence in the First Testament. 2,504 times it is uh, repeated, the term Eretz. So what does this term mean? Why is the land so important? Has to be called holy. If the land in general is a gift from the Creator to the creature, the land of Israel is the one promised to Abraham together with his descendants. We are all children of Abraham, our father in faith, and God promises uh, the land, the holy land, to Abraham. And so from the very beginnings of our identities as uh, believers, there is a link with the land marked by the touch of God, which bears the trace of his passage as Jacob observed, certainly the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. It is a land where milk and honey flow, a land promised to the fathers, a condition of free re life and fully realized in obedience to the Most High. <coughs> not just the land free from foreign dominion, but the land on which the chosen people will live free from the bonds of sin and firm in fidelity to the covenant that binds them to God. So symbol of the Lord's generous and free gift, this land is also a constant reminder of a task to be lived. It is inseparably promised grace and vocation. Ownership of the land itself will be conditioned on fidelity to the covenant. I record it, reminded this by Deuteronomy 4 and 8, so that Israel will be effectively the people of God. In this sense, the promised land is an objective to be con conquered over and over again. And this will happen if the people are docile to the will of God. Precisely so, the promised land is kept in the memory and desire of the chosen people. It becomes a symbol and the seal of the covenant with God and represents the deposit of the hope of Israel. Eretz Israel is above all the object of the yearning of the people chosen from among the peoples. As, I would like to quote these beautiful verses by Yehuda HaLewi, Jewish poet of the 11th century. If I had wings, I could fly to you, O Jerusalem. From great distance, your stones give me pleasure, your dust I honor. The air of your country is real life for our soul. These are uh, truly beautiful words which uh, derive from a great love. The Holy Land is then the symbol and the seal of Israel's covenant with God. As Andre Neher writes, the author of the uh, beautiful book From Biblical Silence to the Silence of uh, Auschwitz, the Zohar wants Eretz to be the Ketubah, the marriage contract of God and Israel. And we feel how much this image tends to make the presence of the land material and immutable in the Jewish religious economy. If 
finally the promised land and here I'm referring to another uh, Jewish thinker of the 20th century Abraham Joshua Heschel the promised land for the chosen people is the deposit of their hope as uh, Heschel writes the Jew in whose heart the love of Zion is extinguished is condemned to lose his faith in the God of Abraham who gave the earth as a pledge for the redemption of all men therefore he continues for the Jews the land of Israel represents their home their hope everything they have and I'd like to say something to David Rosen uh, sometimes uh, we've um, spoken of the determination and, and um, with which uh, Israel defends its land and, so, and I've asked him sometimes isn't it sometimes exaggerated and uh, David um, led me to understand that it's not uh, exaggerated uh, for one reason either Israel stands or falls in its relationship with the land so it is a matter not only of uh, defense um, and uh, we're reminded of this by the attacks in recent days but it is a question of identity of deep belonging I um, I think we can say that uh, the land has always been in the heart of uh, the Jews, even when they did not have it. Um, today we have it in the form of possession, but it's always been there in the form of desire. Next year in Jerusalem, that is how you close your um, Passover feast every year. So for uh, Jews, the land is uh, the hope and the future. The faith of Israel considers the holy land, the place where the divine plan of history can reveal its original and unique meaning. It was sanctified by the words of the prophets, by the sufferings of an entire people, by the tears and supplication of millennia of history, by the toil and dedication of the pioneers. This holiness is precious in the eyes of God, vital for the people, light for history. Those who fail to understand this will never understood uh, Israel or the Holy Land. If uh, he only sees in the land a um, place in geography, he will not be able to understand. Uh, some Jews have also made this mistake. There was a time before the establishment of the land of Israel there was discussion among Israel's where to establish Israel they were um, suggestions made of other places but uh, today we understand why it was so important for the land to be that land founded in the memory of the wonders accomplished by God in the history of the salvation of his people thus for example has happened when they came out of slavery in Egypt even the entrance into the promised land is the fruit of the divine initiative and the crossing of the Jordan near Jericho traces the events of the Exodus and the crossing of the Red Sea. Once reached and inhabited, then the Promised Land will have to be defended by faith. Thus, the walls of Jericho will collapse not by the strength of military art, but by a solemn liturgy lasting for seven days, in which the protagonist will be the Ark of the Covenant. If, therefore, it was faith that brought down the walls of the city of Jericho, it will be the lack of faith that creates an impediment to the conquest and lasting possession of the land. This is why enjoying the promised land will be inseparable from the new heart with which the people will inhabit it. And uh, therefore the land God will live in will be uh, recognized in the human heart renewed by the breath of the Spirit but uh, we must not separate this from the concrete nature of that land the return to the land of Israel become a sign and a foretaste of the return to the land with the prophets see occurring in a distant future which will involve all of humankind <clears throat> so you can understand why a Christian like me can love the land of Israel so much uh, I have been to Israel more than 50 times and this expresses not just uh, a too, uh, touristic uh, interest in uh, the place but a true love because it's there where you can understand the, the story of the covenant and salvation as a Christian it's there that you better understand uh, Lord Jesus so Jesus uh, will avoid all attempt to reduce uh, 
the hope of the kingdom to a political and military expectation. But uh, for sure, his love and his belonging to Israel makes uh, Jesus a Jew and a Jew forever. So a Jew and a Jew forever, because that's what will help us understand this value. And the eschatological gathering predicted by the prophets is not uh, just simply the recomposition of Israel in the land of Father, because uh, all children of God will be gathered in the unity of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But as a matter of fact, in this perspective, nothing has been taken out of the value of that holy root of the Christian tree, which is Israel and the privileged land where the destiny, its destiny is uh, taking place. In the Holy Land, the Jesus, the Jew, uh, was working, and that is where the disciples uh, started off. Uh, so the faith is not addressing an abstract God far away from the human events, but uh, it is addressing the land where the man lived and then manifested himself to men. And the stones of the holy places are nourishing faith. In Jew, in the Jewish uh, reality, there is a, something that has got to do with Ben and Benim, the stones and the children. And this is where God may obtain uh, children from stones. But the meaning of this wonderful saying is that the holy stones of uh, the land, the holy land, uh, will allow us to regenerate ourselves as children of the highest. And now let me come to the conclusion of my own reflection. In the light of uh, these premises, the declaration delineates uh, an, an evaluation and a re-evaluation of the state of relations between Judaism and Christianity. And uh, acknowledging, quite honestly, a certain initial skepticism, which was due to the long history of uh, Christian anti-Judaism, the text then observes that in the course of time, it has made it clear that the transformations in the church's attitudes and teachings were not only sincere, but even uh, in more increasingly profound. A special attention is then devoted to the works of the bilateral commission between the chief rabbinate of Israel and the Holy See. There are a number of members today, one of which is Hoffman, who is our beloved uh, organizer of everything and somewhat uh, uh, also very much respected. And whenever he says something, we have to obey. But uh, this commission, in its 13 meetings, uh, previous meetings, uh, that were taking place in Jerusalem and in Rome, uh, was capable of highlighting the shared values uh, in the respect of differences. Uh, but now, what is the evaluation of the declaration of this pathway? Well, all of us, uh, we both Catholics and Jews, acknowledge that this fraternity cannot sweep away our doctrinal differences. Uh, it does rather reinforce uh, the mutual positive dispositions uh, towards fundamental values that we all share, including the respect of the Hebrew Bible, but that are not just limited to that. Uh, the ideological differences are stated with honesty and could be summarized in the formula coined by Shalom ben Korin, the faith of Jesus unites us, but the faith in Jesus separates us. Notwithstanding this profound difference, the declaration then observes that some of the highest uh, Judaism authorities were asserting that the Christians maintain a special status because they worship the creator of heaven and earth, who liberated the people of Israel from Egyptian bondage and also exercises providence all over the creation. And hence, the final statement for the future. However, do doctrinal differences are our inability to truly understand the meanings and mysteries of each other's fates must not stand in the way of the peaceful collaboration for the betterment of our common world and of the lives of the children of Noah. To further reach this end, it is crucial for our faith communities to continue to meet, to grow acquainted one with another, and uh, earn each other's trust. Thus, the road forward is traced. Let me say that the di dialogue with the Jewish people is the model of dialogue that we should all try to get inspiration from. And this is why we should understand that with a happy decision, the day for the 
Judeo-Christian dialogue was uh, established on the month of February because that is when the week of the prayers uh, begins uh, with the date of the 18th. We wanted to say that the root also of our meetings stands in the dialogue with Israel. And for this reason, we should try and find the collaboration of the Catholic communication according to the declaration and of other faith communities so as to allow for the future of religious freedom, so as to promote the moral principles of our faiths and the sanctity of life and the significance of the traditional life and to cultivate the moral and religious conscience of society. Each one of us then, especially those who are deeply involved in the service of faith and of theology, well, our thoughts also need to cultivate the love, the passion for Judaism and for the dialogue of, with the Jewish world. And the reference to violence is uh, inspired to form of insane religious fundamentalism, which affect many Middle East Christians and elsewhere, should be then turned into an appeal to the Catholic Church, an appeal coming from Orthodox Judaism. And here I quote, in order to join in deepening our combat against the generation of new barbarism in the radical offshoots of Islam, which endanger our global society and does not even spare the very numerous uh, moderate Muslims. A dialogue, in other words, that should allow us to get used to dialogue, but at the same time to measure and isolate those who are the enemies of dialogue. The call is extended to all people of goodwill because they should unite in order to fight the evil. Now let me come to the final reflections. The patrimony of faith shared by Catholic and Jews will then probably sustain the common commitment placed at the service of all humanity. The text quotes the origin, the divine origin of the Torah, the idea of a final redemption the affirmation that religions must use moral behavior and religious education and not war, not coercion or violence so as to allow for their ability to influence and inspire. So allow me to please publicly express my deep pain, the pain I perceived when I heard the declarations of the Patriarch of Moscow as to the war in Ukraine, because religion should never justify a war, never. Violence is not uh, to be justified in the name of God. And the uh, authentic dialogue with Judaism uh, should purify all consciences uh, from all form of violence, anti-Semitism, so as to allow for the quality of everybody's life to grow. And then let's conclude by saying that we invite all Christian confessions uh, to follow the example of the Christian Catholic Church uh, and to remove from their own uh, liturgies and doctrines the expressions of anti-Semitism and interrupt uh, all of the missions towards Jews and to work towards a better world uh, hand in hand with the Jewish people. And the final purpose seems to be very touching because it recalls the biblical prophets as well as uh, the words uh, spoken on the mount. We try and seek to deepen our dialogue so as to improve the world uh, and to talk along the ways of God, to nourish uh, the hungry and to give joy to widows and orphans, uh, to provide uh, shelter to the oppressed and the persecuted and thus merit his blessing. So obedience uh, to the eternal one and the love for all his creatures are the ultimate reason for which the journey in dialogue between the Jerusalem and Rome must go ahead, should stay open to the surprises of the Eternal One and be nurtured by the sincere yearning for the faithful obedience of Jews and Christians to his will. On this way, both Jews and Christians shall obey the command of the Eternal One. Thank you. Thank you. That's for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have the honor to introduce my discussant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Your Excellency Archbishop Forte, dear Chief Rabbi Dizeni, Your Excellency Ambassador Schutz, dear rabbis, dear reverend fathers, dear sisters, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, 
I am deeply honored to take part in this special event so beautifully connected to a tradition of, uh, to, to a tradition of fruitful Jewish-Christian exchanges, still a historical novelty that our generation has had the privilege to enjoy after so many centuries in which this was completely unthinkable. It is this especially delightful for me to enter into conversation with Professor Forte, whose great contribution to Jewish-Christian dialogue I have been following over many years, and you might not remember because I was half a baby then, but you even agreed to give me an interview once in Jerusalem, which was very, very helpful to the evolvement, to the evolution of my, uh, my work. And now today, even though we had so, 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 so long corona crisis, we can finally also get together and it's lovely to see so many people who um, contributed so much to Jewish-Christian dialogue. So again, I'm very honored. I would like to state from the outset that though I am Jewish myself, I do not have the pretense to speak here as a representative of the Jewish community. I am participating in this insightful conversation as a scholar with a profound interest in the remarkable transformative strength of the Jewish-Christian relationship and in the determination of both the Jewish and the Christian communities to better their relations while also maintaining their faithfulness and sense of continuity with their respective traditions. Archbishop Porter's paper provides a splendid example of the nature of the transformation taking place in Jewish-Christian relations in his choice of the relatively recent Jewish Orthodox Declaration on Jewish-Christian relations between Jerusalem and Rome as the topic of his lecture. This declaration in itself is a response to previous Catholic initiatives, first and foremost among them Nostra Aetate IV, Yet Nostra Aetate itself, as we know, responds to Jewish interlocutors and experiences so that we have in front of us today a Catholic voice responding to Jewish voices, responding to Catholic voices, responding to Jewish voices, and evolving tradition of dialogue. Between Jerusalem and Rome testifies to the fact that the Jewish Orthodox community recognizes the seriousness of the shift in the Catholic Church's approach to Jews and Judaism. At the core of the Jewish Orthodox Declaration, one, one finds a careful balancing between, on the one hand, identifying Christians as central partners to the Jewish mission of amending the world, and on the other, evoking the unbridgeable doctrinal differences between Judaism and Christianity. Archbishop Forte affirms the Jewish Orthodox emphasis on difference in stating that, now I'm going to quote you, it's embarrassing to quote a person that is, yeah, Israel and the church are called to walk unmingled, even if inseparable, towards the final wholeness to be undertaken by the Lord in that eschatological shalom, which is the object of the messianic hope of both peoples. I agree the quotation. <laughs> Grazie <laughs> mille. Nevertheless, while respecting difference, Catholics have also often expre expressed the Church's deeply felt conviction that Judaism is not exactly an external partner to Christianity, but one that is intimately connected to the Church herself. In Professor Professor Forte's speech, this conviction is particularly, particularly evident in the citation he brings from the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable, stating that, we are going to do it again, the Jewish-Christian dialogue can only with reservations be termed interreligious dialogue in the true sense of the expression. One could, however, speak of a kind of intra-religious or intra-familial dialogue sui generis. Indeed, Nostra Aetate begins with, a, Nostra Aetate IV begins with a statement that thinking about the Jewish people means for the church searching its own mystery. And John Paul II affirms that the Jewish religion is not extrin extrinsic to us Catholics, but in a certain way is intrinsic to our own religion. 
This, it seems to me, is at the heart of the Jewish-Christian asymmetry. While Jews tend to define Christianity as another religion, Christians tend to define Judaism as a fundamental yet somewhat inchoate form of Christianity. The Christian dialectical perception of Jews and Judaism as both self and other is rooted, of course, in the Christian identification of the story of Israel as encapsulated in the Hebrew Bible, both as the history of the Jews and as the history of the church, the two belonging in different ways to the category of Israel. The biblical narratives, therefore, reveal at one and the same time information about God's dealings with the Jewish people, while also pointing beyond the particularity of the Jews to the horizon of a universal faith community. As part of the church's post nostrata theology, it, becomes, it became clear that these two components are not either or and do not replace each other in the progress of history with the Christ event as the supersession's junction, but rather they are complementary. That is, the Bible speaks to both Jews and Christians about both Jews and Christians in their unmingled status throughout history. The now central concept of the never revoked covenant between God and the Jewish people implies that the dawning of Christianity did not make the ways in which contemporary Jews uphold the covenant obsolete. This dialectic perception of the biblical Israel extended to the present Israel through the concept of covenantal irrevocability seems to be of utmost importance for the question of the theological meaning of the land of Israel too. Is the doctrinal importance that contemporary Judaism attaches to the land of Israel a locus of unbridgeable doctrinal differences between Jews and Catholics, or rather has an intrinsic Catholic theological meaning? Does the Catholic affirmation of the irrevocability of the Jewish covenant with God include the land of Israel? Professor Fote begins his sensitive engagement with this uneasy question by affirming the special place that the land of Israel occupies in Jewish consciousness from the Hebrew Bible to eminent Jewish authors such as Yehuda Halevi, the Zohar, as well as uh, modern thinkers such as André Ner and Abraham Joshua Heschel. Archbishop Forte then ties together the Jewish memory of the biblical past in the land of Israel with the eschatological future, enjoying the promise, the pro now I'm going to quote you again, you have to tell me if you agree. <laughs> yeah. Enjoying the promised land, Professor Forte reads, will be inseparable from the new heart with which the people will inhabit it. And the tragedy of exile will be a consequence of infidelity to the gift received. Additionally, the return to the land of Israel will become a sign and an anticipation of the return to the land that the prophets see taking place in the distant future and which will affect the whole of humanity. However, the frequent, the frequent use which you, Professor Forte, make, makes, um, uh, which you make of the future tense raises an important question about the theological status of the present. Does the current history of the Jews, their gathering in large numbers in the Holy Land, the land of Israel, Palestine, it is not even possible to agree on the place's name, and the founding and continued existence of the state of Israel with all its difficulties pertain to the covenantal history of the Jewish people, considering the place of the land within the biblical concept of the covenant. If so, would you say, Professor Forte, that the current history of the Jews in the land is a fulfillment, even a partial one, of those prophetic verses which you cite, or rather, would you say
History is in itself a sign of this eschatological future. If this is the case, does the current reality in the land of Israel anticipate a future conversion of Jews, even if one avoids any attempt to hasten this point in time? To phrase this differently, is the particular relationship between the Jews and the land after Christ important only for its future abandonment for the sake of a more, quotation, definitive land which will no longer have any differentiation from heaven? And if Catholic theology cannot affirm a theological meaning to the current history of Jews in the land, would it not entail that Jewish history is merely a parenthesis phenomenon, a time in which the Jewish branches, this time not roots, because the roots are the Bible, but branches broken off um, of that good olive tree, awaiting their final regrafting? On the other hand, doesn't a non-supersessionistic view which affirms the continuous present particularity of the relationship between the Jews and the land necessarily entail a discriminative attitude towards the other non-Jewish inhabitants of the land and a biased approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. With all honesty, these questions seem to me at one and the same time both impossible to answer and impossible not to attend to, especially due to the growing Catholic conviction that the Judaism, which is considered internal to the church's identity, is not only Old Testament Judaism, but also associated with post-Christum Jewish history. This makes the concreteness of the land of Israel and the particularity of the Jewish interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures important for Catholic theology, not just metaphorically, nor even just eschatologically. And you begin to explore this with what you, with you, with what you now said about Jewish, uh, Jesus' Jewish, Jewishness, and I find this a very interesting uh, route. On the other hand, a Catholic attempt to answer these questions, which are of course far from being consensually answered among Jews, may entail also making judgments and prioritizing certain Jewish perceptions and lifestyles over others. It might even mean entering into the murky waters of evaluating contemporary Jewish behavior in terms of sins and docility to God's will. How would Jews who see Christians as others, not as self, feel about such decisive Catholic evaluations of their own history, for better or worse. The question of the land thus penetrates directly into the heart of the Jewish Christian complexity. The fact, however, that we can discuss these things together in the here and now, in the present, is already a piece of heaven. Thank you.